Previously on California City. Wait a minute. I am in business. I don't want to say anything about suicide, okay? No, don't. Don't don't do that. Well, first of all, we've never misrepresented. We just don't do it. You know, I mean, I it's this the way I live my life. My takeaway is that either they really don't know what the salespeople are saying or they're totally bullshitting us. You hear me, Tom? I'm talking to you right now, Tom Maney. Shame on you. Do you feel bad that you brought people there? Very bad. I feel very bad. If you don't count the American Legion in the VFW, California City is a one-bar town. The bar is inside a Chinese restaurant called the Green Tea Garden. They have a wood-paneled jukebox that plays mostly country, although James and I picked Jewel and TLC off playlists written in Sharpie. We shot pool in the neon glow of red Budweiser signs. We drank what passed for craft beer. We noticed the 20-year-old cigarette burns on the red carpet. Part of the reason we hung out there so much was that on our first day in town, we'd gotten a tip that the woman who owned the Green Tea Garden knew a lot about Silver Saddle. It was James who'd gotten the tip. He was hanging out in the park on election day in 2018, and he started talking to this guy named John Davidson, who just got done voting. His big issue was the gas tax. He didn't want to pay more to drive his truck. He was in his 50s, ex-Air Force, his eyes hidden behind sunglasses, and his hair hidden beneath a trucker hat. He had a handlebar mustache. No hiding that. And, um, yeah, how would you uh, describe California City? Um, it's a small town, a uh, small community, uh, out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> not much uh, to do out here, not unless you're riding a dirt bike or uh, playing sports. John thought California City was going to shit which we noticed was a common opinion among the older white people in town. And um, what has changed since you've lived here? <laughs> they allowed Section 8 in. <laughs> Ruined the city. Can you elaborate? Back in 95 when I came out here, the crime was very low. Yeah. But now that they allowed Section 8 in, it's caused a lot of problems. It is a small community and you don't have that much law enforcement. And then the other thing we heard a lot about is this place called Silver Saddle Ranch. Do you know anything about it? Yeah, I think it's a corrupted place. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say that? Sell, it's a real estate scheme, you know, selling properties, promising that there's going to be improvements, the city's growing and all that, and nothing ever happens. So people default on their taxes on the property, and, and guess who repurchases it once it goes into foreclosure? Who do you think purchases it? They do. There you go. Yeah. At the time, James and I did not understand what John was talking about. But we do now. When James asked him if he'd be willing to talk any further, he put his key in the ignition. And he muttered, nah, I'm good. It's a small town. They might take me out. I have to say is that, like, every time, uh, like, a conversation heads in that direction, people get afraid to talk. Why is that? It's just a small town. People know everybody. And then came the tip. There's a green tea garden. Talk to them. Green tea garden? That lady's been there for a long time. Interesting. Okay. We went that same night. We went late, and the place was nearly empty. We sat down at a booth, and we ordered cream cheese wontons. A thin woman in a boxy sweatshirt and loose jeans came over to deliver them. Kathy Yip, she owned the place. We started chatting, and after a minute or so... I did what I always do. So this is our gear. This is my microphone. I, it likes to be close to people because then it, you know, it's just how it works. Were well, you going to ask me a question or some shit? Yeah, James will ask you. I'll just hold it. Yeah, I guess I could ask you. Would you... Will you tell us your name first? Wait, hold on. Oh. Do you feel comfortable doing this? This is the only tape I have of Kathy. Because once I pulled out my mic and we started asking her about Silver Saddle... She started backing away from the table and waving her hands in front of her. Wait a minute. I am in business. I don't want to say anything about suicide, okay? No, don't. Don't, don't do that. Okay. It was going to be a lot harder than we thought to get people to talk about Silver Saddle. And I think that's part of the reason they've managed to stay in business for so long. They're kind of an open secret. I'm Emily Guerin, and welcome to California City, Episode 6.
Kathy Yip didn't want to talk to us about Silver Saddle, but she kept feeding us names of people who might. And one Thursday night at the bar, Kathy cornered a woman who was playing pool and instructed her to tell us everything she knew. So the three of us went out back, and we stood in the wet alley beneath the streetlight. It was cold, and she was shivering in a thin cotton sweatshirt. She was pretty drunk, and I felt kind of slimy to be interviewing her at all. This isn't what she sounds like, by the way. She asked us to distort her voice. So what should we know about Silver Saddle? I've been here for a long time, and I know they're pretty scandalous as far as they try to sell people land which they cannot resell because it's out in the middle of nowhere. I really want to cuss. I'm sorry. Okay, you can say whatever you want. No, no, I'm not going to cuss. And I could tell this woman did want to talk to us, but it also felt like she was holding something back. Because it is a small knit community. And so everybody knows everybody. So you never know if you talk to somebody, if you're going to be beat up or ostracized or whatever, because this this is such a small knit community. And then she backed away from the microphone and silently mouthed, I'm done. This kept happening. It happened at a diner at the California City Airport called Foxy's Landing. A waitress there once told me she served salespeople coffee as they pushed paperwork on potential clients. She thought it was weird, but it was none of her business. It happened on top of a butte, on a hike with a woman who knows the name of like every single Mojave Desert plant. Although she agreed to an interview, she later asked me not to use her name. She reminded me, She had to live in California City. She had a daughter. She was afraid of the repercussions of being seen as someone who would talk to a reporter about Silver Saddle. It was starting to feel like no one was willing to talk about Silver Saddle, unless they were drunk or anonymous or both. Until one night at the Green Tea Garden, when Kathy gave us another name, Teresa Grimshaw. Teresa is a real estate agent who specializes in selling land in California City. Her Zillow page says, I believe in honesty and fair dealing not only with my clients, but with everyone connected in a real estate transaction. Teresa says she gets lots of calls from unhappy people who bought land at Silver Saddle. I probably get a call a day. Are you serious? Yeah. Wow, that's way more than I thought you were going to say. She gently tells them that yes, although she is a real estate agent, she cannot sell their land. So you're saying there's almost no resale market for the lots that Silver Saddle is selling? Yes. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Um, Do you feel like the buyers knew that going into it based on your conversations with them? No. But most of them, believe it or not, they appreciate my honesty. I've had very few, if anybody, get angry at me for telling them my opinion. We were talking in her real estate office, an echoey building on California City Boulevard. The wind kept rattling the windows. Teresa's long gray hair was wrapped around her shoulders like a shawl. She looked small and cold in her big office chair. (laughs) I, I wanted to put a sign out there telling people Do your due diligence, beware. Caveat emptor. You know, buyer beware. What would the sign look like? (laughs) It would have been at least four by eight. It would have been in like bright yellow with big letters on it. I wonder what would have happened if Teresa's sign had been up when Ben Perez was driving out to Silver Saddle. A big yellow and black sign, four feet by eight feet like you might see at a construction site. A sign warning you not to buy land out here from a woman who sells land out here. Maybe Ben would have turned to his buddy Clifford and asked, what the hell is that? Maybe Clifford would have ignored him, just brushed him off. But we'll never know because Teresa never built that sign. You don't want to say something and end up not being able to find your body somewhere. 
<laughs> there's a lot of land out there because <laughs> there's been a reputation up here in the high desert too, of places for people to just dump bodies. I said this once, but I'm going to say it again. I talked to a lot of people in California City, and no one ever accused anyone affiliated with Silver Saddle of a violent crime. Ever. But I understand why Teresa feels scared. California City does feel kind of lawless. A police sergeant here told me they do find bodies out in the desert occasionally, along with trash and stolen cars and other things people want to disappear. Dateline did a story last year about the town's eight unsolved murders. And on the outskirts of town, there's three billboards that a mother put up, admonishing the police to solve her daughter's murder. Do you feel like a lot of people in town know what Silver Saddle is doing and how they operate? Oh, yes. Everybody knows. Yes. But the thing is, is what they're doing, is, is, as far as we know, is not illegal. The police sergeant I talked to said he had no idea about Silver Saddle. I don't get involved in real estate, he told me. But there was one California City cop who had been suspicious of them, a guy named Steve Colrick. Steve grew up in Arizona, but he visited California City a ton as a kid because his grandparents owned the concrete plant in town. He told me it was idyllic back in the 60s and 70s before Great Western Cities declared bankruptcy and the city began to fall apart. In the early 80s, Steve became a cop in California City, and it didn't take long before he started hearing rumors about Silver Saddle from one of the older guys on the police force. He came right out and said that Silver Saddle was, uh, was, was a scam. And I'll admit, I, up to that point, I didn't pay attention to that stuff. I didn't care. Uh, it didn't interest me that they weren't selling drugs or gangbanging. I didn't care. For years, Steve didn't think about Silver Saddle. But that changed around the time his infant grandson died, two days after Easter in 2002. The Historical Society offered to build a little memorial to the baby boy along this old wagon trail that once ran through town. It's mostly been paved over, but Steve had heard that way out in the desert, the ruts were still there worn into the dirt by heavy wagon wheels more than 100 years ago. For some reason, Steve became obsessed with finding these ruts. He told me, it just seemed like something I needed to do. Got on my dirt bike and I started riding. I'm going, I gotta find this, this trail. Where's the ruts at? I couldn't find the ruts. Steve crisscrossed the empty plane on his Honda, searching for a thing that almost no one else cared to find. And over time, his obsession morphed into something larger, the history of California City. Steve began collecting old ads, articles, and documents about Nat Mendelssohn and the town's early pioneers. He had an entire white banker's box full of the stuff. And he brought it to my room at the Best Western on one of my visits and began rifling through it. Robinson, Mendelssohn. Steve is a meaty guy with small eyes, big ears, and divots on the sides of his head from years of wearing his sunglasses too tight. He has a retired cop buzz cut and a gray mustache that you can almost hear as he talks. This is for you. What is this? I wrote that. Steve pulled out a piece of yellow lined notebook paper. Is this your little timeline of who owned what and when? Yeah, this was my first sketch that I did. Um, it was a handwritten timeline of all the major events in the history of California City. In the 1950s, when Nat Mendelssohn started selling land. In the 70s, when his company got sold to the Hunt Brothers. And it goes to Great Western Cities. Right. And then you have this whole period of class action lawsuits and Ralph Nader. Also in the 70s, you have the lawsuits and the investigations. And then in the 80s, Silver Saddle's creation. When Steve was making this timeline, he wasn't totally sure if Silver Saddle had anything to do with Great Western Cities or not. They seemed kind of similar, but he just didn't know. So he started asking around, quietly. He wasn't building a case, but he said it kind of felt that way. I had to be careful on what questions I asked, because I didn't, sometimes I didn't know who's who. And, and there was, most of the time, I didn't ask questions. I tried to find out the answers on my own. 
One day, Steve talked to one of Silver Saddle's owners, this guy named Jim Quiggle, who died before I got a chance to meet him. He worked with Tom Maney for years. And Steve said the guy just seemed evasive, which Steve thought was weird. I mean, most people, when they talk about history, they want to share what they know. Steve became the police chief in California City in 2008. And after that, he asked two of his detectives to talk to the Kern County District Attorney about how to investigate Silver Saddle. And Steve says the DA told him, don't even waste your time. There was no way our department, if there was a crime, had the resources to do a um, financial white collar investigation like that. Plus, Steve says no one complained about Silver Saddle to the police department. There was no victim. And without a victim, he didn't have a case. So Steve let it go. And then in 2011, he retired. He focused on his rock collection, his dachshunds, and his wagon wheel ruts. But I could tell it bothered Steve. It seemed like he regretted not doing more. He told me once, back in April 2018. Emily, I think after a while, you resign yourself to what fight you can win and what fight you can do more damage to yourself if you try to push the issue. A few months later, James tried to ask him again about his regrets. But something had changed. Yeah, so, you know, going back on the um, phone conversation you had with Emily, I thought I, uh, you know, heard that you did have some sort of regrets about not looking into them of sorts. I didn't lose any sleep over it, if, if that's what you're asking. I mean, with you, um, would you say that Silver Saddle was doing any sort of suspicious activity? I never had any personal knowledge of that. Suddenly, he made Silver Saddle out to be this fun after-work hangout. Looking back on it, what I remember is countless Christmas parties, retirement parties, and it was nice, good food, really good food, good atmosphere. A lot of fun, a lot of dancing. That's, That's what I remember. That's probably what I'll choose to remember. What he'll choose to remember. I'm still struggling to make sense of what he did next. He handed me his banker's box of documents, and he told me to make copies of whatever I wanted. He said he trusted me. You're more than welcome for me to leave this. I can leave this here, and you guys can just go through. Oh, like overnight, and we can bring it back? Yeah, I trust you. Okay. He said he was glad I was looking into Silver Saddle. He said I was one of the good ones. But then he started ignoring me. He stopped answering my calls and texts. The last time we talked, it was only because he butt-dialed me on Thanksgiving from Catalina Island. It was our last interaction. I was starting to think the town itself was the problem. It was too small, too insular, too gossipy. Nobody here was going to put themselves on the line. I needed to find people who had less at stake. So I thought back to that weird tax default foreclosure thing that John Davidson had told James about in the park. Maybe Silver Saddle had a paper trail. I decided to find it. That's after a break. The Kern County administrative offices are in Bakersfield, at the very bottom of the Central Valley. They're next to the railroad tracks and across from the convention center, where you can see a KISS concert or a monster truck rally or The Bachelor live on stage. I know Bakersfield gets a bad rap, but I love it. It reminds me of all the small Great Plains cities that I used to hang out in when I lived in North Dakota. The railroads, the dust, the cattle, and the coal. The county assessor's office is on the third floor. I signed my name on the visitor sheet, and I walked down a long carpeted hallway to a small office. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we're we're sitting in uh, my office. My name's Lee Smith. I'm the assistant assessor. I'm with Emily... Garen. Garen, and and I'm waiting for questions. (laughs) Okay, okay. So, um... Have you heard of Silver Saddle? Oh, yeah. They've been around for a long time. Okay. And 
Um, like, what do you know about them? Um, well, um... Lee Smith reminded me of a Sunday school teacher. Sweet and afraid to piss anyone off. He'd been working for the assessor for as long as I'd been alive. I asked him when he first noticed something unusual about land sales in California City. When was the first time you sort of started thinking that, like, it was a different kind of market than, say, Bakersfield? Um, pretty early ago on. Pretty early on. Because what were you seeing even back then? This is what we're seeing today. What Lee Smith was seeing back then and today was Silver Saddle selling the same pieces of land over and over. The way it worked was somebody would buy a lot from Silver Saddle for anywhere from ten to forty thousand dollars, and then after a few years they'd realize it was just a bad investment. So they'd stop paying their property taxes, and the county would take possession and auction it off. And at these auctions, Silver Saddle would buy the land back for like $500, and they'd turn it around and sell it again. So when you see this over and over, does it like raise any red flags for you? Um, that's a good question. Um, um, May, could you describe what you what, what, what a red flag what a be? red flag means? Like, are they running some kind of land scam where they're ripping people off and deceiving them about the value of the land? Um, that's a good question. That good question is one that state investigators would ask themselves later on. Uh, that, yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question, is what Lee Smith said when he got uncomfortable. He smiled and shifted in his seat, crossing and recrossing his legs. You know, the assessor's office has its role, and our role is to assess the value. We aren't necessarily an enforcement entity. We're, we're just there to value the property. So if you're, you're asking me if I think it's fraudulent, that's, that's really not my role. Like, I don't know, I guess it, it just seems interesting that, like, the people who would notice the trend, like your office, can't, can't necessarily, like, do something about it. Um, like, if you're worried... Okay, okay, okay. Oh, now that's a good question. You know, and, and um, I mean, so, so you, okay, so, so this is, you know, kind of the question I have for somebody who says, do something about it. So what would we, what would you suggest? I mean, you could contact the DA. They have a, like a consumer complaints division. And, 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 and a lot of people do do that. But Lee didn't contact the DA. He wasn't one of those people. It wasn't his job. What do I want to say? In Kern County, you know, this is, this is not, a, not really a secret, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, 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 you know, it's been going on. Like everybody knows this is what happens in California City. Yeah. <laughs> and it was true. Everyone I talked to at the assessor's office that day knew that Silver Saddle was selling the same pieces of land over and over. The nice lady who helped me log into the property records database, she knew. She whispered to me, it happens a lot out there in the desert. The chief appraiser, she knew too. She told me she regularly sees people buying empty desert land for more than 10 times what she thinks it's worth. The Kern County treasurer and tax collector, Jordan Kaufman, he also knew. He runs the tax auctions, and for years he's watched Silver Saddle buy its own land back for a couple hundred bucks. He actually got a law passed recently, closing that loophole. But the law didn't stop Silver Saddle from selling a confusing desert real estate investment to unsuspecting people like Ben Perez. Is there anything that you could do about it as the tax collector? Uh, n not really. I mean, I, I focus on what my sort of constitutional duty is in the state of California, which is to, you know, get properties back in revenue producing status however I can, whether it's through a tax sale or just the normal collection of taxes. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if it's not the job of the tax collector or the assessor 
to report or investigate the possibility of fraud, then whose job is it? I went to the district attorney in charge of white collar crime in Kern County. He said he'd only received two complaints ever about Silver Saddle, and he'd forwarded one of them to the California Department of Real Estate. So I asked the California Department of Real Estate, and they said they'd received 17 complaints since 1984. But nothing had come of it. They'd closed all 17 without taking any disciplinary action against Silver Saddle. That got me wondering about the Federal Trade Commission. The FTC told me they'd received 14 complaints about Silver Saddle since 2014. But as far as I can tell, they didn't act on any of them. I told Ken Donny about this, and it really pissed him off. My alma mater has dropped the ball on this big time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm talking to you uh, guys and gals. Uh, His phone cut out, but he said, I'm talking to you guys and gals at the FTC. You really did drop the ball. You should have stopped this a long time ago. Ken demanded I ask the FTC what had happened. What went wrong? Why hadn't they enforced their big 1977 court judgment against Great Western Cities, the one that Ken believed applied to Silver Saddle? So I did. And they wrote back and said, no comment. There was one last place to look, the Mojave Desert News. It's the only newspaper based in California City. And when I was there in the fall of 2018, there was only one reporter covering the city, this guy named Kane Wickham who goes by Citizen Kane. And it was immediately apparent to me, talking to Kane, why the Mojave Desert News had not investigated Silver Saddle. The former publisher had worked with Tom Maney for years. He was one of Tom's former business partners. He was that guy Steve Kolrick had said seemed evasive. Kane once stealthily took pictures of me and James at a California City Council meeting with his Zoom lens, and he sent them to us later. I had no idea what to make of it. I was no longer surprised that something so bad had been going on in California City for so long. The people who were suspicious of Silver Saddle were afraid to speak up. Or they didn't have the time, or the money, or the bandwidth to investigate. Or they didn't think it was their job, or their jurisdiction. (sighs) Which honestly made me feel tired and jaded, and kind of sad. And then, on October 1st, 2019, at 11.26 a.m., an email appeared in my inbox. It read, California Department of Business Oversight sues to stop $30 million Silver Saddle Ranch investment fraud. I scanned it. I saw phrases like illegal land sales, high-pressure sales tactics, and false promises. I saw Marion DeCrew and Tom Maney's names. I saw Silver Saddle and Great Western Cities. I stood up at my desk and I ran in my socks over to my editor. And I blurted out, oh my God, they're finally getting shut down. That's next time on the final episode of California City. One small correction. Since we fact-checked this story, the California Department of Real Estate received three additional complaints about Silver Saddle. One resulted in disciplinary action against the company. California City is written and reported by me, Emily Guerin. Arwen Champion Nix and James Kim did our sound design, production, and story editing. Mike Kessler is our editor. Fact-checking and additional production by Gabriel Donatoff. Mixing by our engineer, Valentino Rivera. Original music by Andrew Epen. The Jane and Ron Olson Center for Investigative Reporting helped make California City possible. Ron Olson is an honorary trustee for Southern California Public Radio. The Olsons do not have any editorial input on the stories we cover. California City is a production of LAist Studios.